What is going on, guys? Episode 8 of the Red Zone Podcast. You know, as always, got some interesting stuff to talk about. Got some stuff that maybe I hoped would be a little bit more uh, interesting, right? In terms of the CFP National Championship. I certainly hoped I was going to be talking about that a bit longer than normal. But uh, as always, as I like to say, um, as you can see in the background, uh, I'd appreciate if you've, you've enjoyed the previous episodes. Like, subscribe, follow the platform on YouTube, Spotify, TikTok, Instagram, all the tags in the back there. Um, but yeah, we can, uh, we can really get started now that we've got all that through. And we can get to the the meat and potatoes of all of it, which is really the just most miserable, sad thing that I have to talk about today. This was a game that, personally, I didn't expect a lot from to begin with. I, on the last podcast, and I think... Um, in my mind before this, I would have said this about this matchup as well. I don't I, I don't think this prediction was totally influenced by the semifinals. I don't think I was being a prisoner to the moment, which I'm proud of in this situation. This this game had no reason to be close. Uh now I did not expect 65-7. I thought I thought Georgia probably won by like 14 to 17, maybe 20. Maybe TCU brings it back late, or maybe TCU got off to a good start, but Georgia just cruised the rest of the way. But neither of those things happened. Not only was UGA the better team, but they got about the luckiest start they possibly could have had. And they were up 10-0 within eight minutes. They were up 17-7 at the end of the first quarter. 38-7 38-7 at the half. It was just, it was literally over at halftime. The game was over at halftime, um, which is kind of a crazy thing to say about a national championship game. Now, while I saw this coming, I did not think TCU's defense would be so consistently hopeless throughout the entire game they had nothing and neither did they the offense the actual problem i'd say is that it was just a total failure from every possible point for tcu they got seven points on the board it was their second drive i i just i don't Max Duggan, I, I, this was always my concern with Duggan as well, was I did not think what he had, what it, I didn't think he had what it took to sit in the pocket, not turn the ball over, and consistently move the ball down the field versus this Georgia defense, and he didn't, he didn't, Max Duggan did not have that, Max Duggan's a great player, he's a very tough guy, this is why I've been very against Max Duggan as an NFL prospect, though, the guy's not an NFL quarterback, at least not yet. Um, he did not do what they needed him to do. Two interceptions, only 150 yards through the air. Just a really, really, really tough game for for him. TCU was outgained 589 yards to 188 which is almost unbelievable it, it it actually it doesn't feel like it really makes sense uh you know max duggan with negative rushing yards negative 38 yards is just it's 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 this we look we don't even really want to talk about this game that much because there wasn't that much to talk about this game this game was boring you know this this was not a good not a good game and i don't think i don't Obviously, I don't think people will have a problem with anyone, um, you know, saying that. But what is interesting about this game is it does bring up a bit of the conversation, which I am, I do think it is pertinent to talk about now that we are approaching the 12-team playoff, is what 
would the 12 team playoff have done to fix this would it have fixed it and and was the selection committee at fault for putting TCU through here now the simplest question for me is was the selection committee at fault and obviously they weren't uh I think it's absolutely insane to uh make any sort of argument about TCU not deserving to be there to uh say that the selection committee messed up by not putting um Alabama through because you know what's funny is people would have said, oh, they should have put USC through if USC had beaten Tulane. Um, so, you know, it's just, it's all just circumstantial hindsight arguments in that regard to people wanting Alabama in there, um, who was not a very good team all year and played an incredibly, incredibly beatable Kansas State team who did just about everything they could to give that game away in the first half. Um, and could have made it much closer if they had just not done some of the stupidest things imaginable on offense. Not to say Bama was not a significantly better team. I don't want that to be lost in that. Bama was a much better team. I knew they would cover. I knew they'd win. But the only reason that game looked so ridiculous was was uh, partially of KSU's own fault, to say. So, I, I don't even want to... I don't even want to field that argument. I think it's kind of ridiculous uh, to insinuate that. But what does become interesting is how could the 12-team playoff have changed this? Now, in a 12-team playoff, TCU would have played Penn State round one. Do we really think that Penn State is beating TCU. Let's be honest with ourselves. Let's be very honest. TCU beat Michigan in a game that even if they lost, even if the, a couple things bounce different and Michigan loses, TC, Michigan wins, TCU loses a very close game against Michigan. Penn State's a much worse team than Michigan this year. TCU would have beaten Penn State. You know, you can't say in, in these sports for 100%, but TCU is a deserving favorite to beat Penn State. And I think most people should be able to agree with that, right? So then you get to who they would have matched up with next. And in the next round, they would have matched up with the winner of Michigan or USC. And guess who I think wins that game? I think it's probably Michigan. So I think they just play Michigan again, and I think they play a very close game with Michigan again, and they may, maybe they beat them, maybe they don't, but who knows. Um, so, I don't know. It's just such a, such a stupid, like, not thought out argument. When in reality, you kind of just have to realize that Michigan dropped the ball and should have beat TCU in a close one, and they probably would have been able to play Georgia a little closer, but then you have to go even further and realize the team that let us all down was Ohio State and Ryan Day, because they were the only team of the Final Four that was built to beat Georgia with a truly elite quarterback, elite wide receivers, um, and talent that could sort of match Georgia's. And they should have won that game, but they dropped it at the end. Uh, and that that led to this. Uh, the, and, and the thing is, Ohio State was not nearly as good as Georgia throughout the whole year. And though I think they would have beaten TCU, I think that could have been a much, much more entertaining game. This is all theoretical, and I mean, what's the point? You know, it's it's not... You know, it's not super relevant, but... You know, it, it does... I, I think once you really think about it, how the playoffs played out makes a lot of sense. Once you think deeply about all the matchups that occurred and how we got them... The results make a lot more sense. Now, while I did just go on the tangent about how TCU deserved to be there and the extended playoff would not have affected them here, 
in the future, I would expect this type of blowout final to be slightly less likely simply due to the virtue of there being a bigger barrier to get in the final, more games, less selection. So you, you just naturally, you have to win more games, and this probably becomes less likely statistically. But this type of thing can always happen. I mean, in the NFL, you have blowout Super Bowls. I mean, you remember Panthers-Broncos, you know? It it just happens. So we see this type thing, and, you know, sometimes there's not really anything we can do about it. We just got to accept that there was a mismatch or something happened that caused us to get a particularly lopsided matchup. And that's just how it goes sometimes. Like, people just want to find meaning where there is not meaning. Sometimes the team's just way worse than the other team and gets blown out. And they were slightly better than another team on a different day. And that team that was way better than them that day was actually slightly worse than another team on another day. But because of how they match up. And, it, and it's just like, just, just think it through. Just think it through. That's all we got to do here. Uh, but you know, that's all, that's my piece on that whole scenario. I, I, I don't think it's like hugely relevant because I think obviously all of this takes place on the field and that's the good thing about a 12 team playoff is more of it's going to get, take it, take place on the field and there's going to be less determined by a committee of people who have no idea what the hell they're talking about. But you know, this stuff can always happen, I guess is, is my end point. You know, I, this will never be impossible. So I, I I guess that's just what I'm, you know, in the end, I'm I'm trying to get at. But, you know, we got more interesting, more important stuff to talk about today. So we got to get off that. Now, the NFL playoffs have arrived. And this, in the years where the Saints are bad, this is when, like, I start razor focusing on the NFL because this this may this may sound sacrilegious to some but regular season football when the saints are not good and i don't have to worry about seeding is not super important to me as a viewer i just kind of tune in for the really good games and the ones that affect me in fantasy now i keep an eye on the teams obviously so i have an idea of what to expect come playoff team and i keep an eye on the stats but this is my time where i'm like okay now the nfl is really starting to kick off and, and it's funny because i think a lot of people would say that about basketball um and i am the same way about that but i think that's just a less common sentiment in the nfl now we're going to start off with the way less interesting side of the bracket that nobody cares, not, no, not nobody cares about, but I mean, we, I don't know. It's just so hard to get ex as excited about the NFC as I am about the AFC this year. Now, round one, we got the Eagles, who were the best team in the NFC all year, had a little bit of a stutter step at the end because they uh, lost Jalen Hurts to injury which also killed my fantasy season and took $800 out of my pocket, but nobody cares about that. Uh, so they get the first seed by, and so the second seed, the 49ers play the Seattle Seahawks. Seattle Seahawks and the 49ers are a really bad matchup for each other. The th This is the thing that popped off popped off the page the second I saw this matchup. I was like, this seems like a bad matchup for the Seahawks. I went and checked the stats, and it was just instantly confirmed. The Seahawks are number 30 in rush defense in the NFL. They are the worst rush defense in the NFL. The 49ers are 8th in rushing offense, but that's total. Their rushing efficiency is number 1 in the NFL. So I have a feeling that Kyle Shanahan is going to pump up the run plays this weekend. But the problem is with Brock Purdy, they're not a team that can't pass the ball either. They're 13th in passing offense, 5th in overall offense, 1st in overall defense. Uh, they're just a much better team, right? And I don't want to just hammer home the idea of it being a bad matchup because it's 
it is a bad matchup, but most importantly, it's just a one really good team at home playing a very mediocre team on the road. Uh, so the 49ers will crush the Seahawks. It won't It won't really be a contest. I'm not super interested in this game because I feel like it's a 99% likelihood that the 49ers win this game, and I think they probably end up winning it pretty easily. Now, this is where we get into the interesting wildcard matchups for the NFC. Because... While Seahawks 49ers, I don't think I will be a contest. These could be a lot more interesting. The New York Giants this year went a very quiet 9-7-1. and They were a very decent team this year. You know, uh, Daniel Jones did the job they needed. You know, he was not a good quarterback, but he kept it going on offense. Brian Dabble made it work with those weapons. And they were below middle... They were a below-the-middle team offensively and defensively, but they had certain strengths, and they were able to win close games, and that propelled them to a 9-7-1 record and a wildcard spot in Brian Dable's first year, which is a hell of an achievement for a Giants team that had been struggling for years and years. I've already said how much I like to disrespect the Vikings. Um, I don't think they are a real 13-4 and four team. They've dropped down to the three seed. That's probably a bit more fair. I do think they're the probably the fourth or third best team in the NFC, but that's more just a statement on how weak the NFC is this year outside the top two. Now, the interesting thing about this matchup is I think this is one of the only teams in the playoffs that I would have taken the Vikings to beat round one. I, I think the Vikings will win this game at home. They're an offensive threat. They're not good defensively, but the Giants aren't great defensively either. Um, and I... I do feel that they'll be able to eke that out. Now, when they played in the regular season, Minnesota won a close game. And I kind of expect that to be the same here. I, I think I'd expect something very, very similar to their 27-24 result in the regular season, actually. Maybe a bit lower scoring or a bit more lopsided in favor of Minnesota, but... I don't know. Aside from that, that seems like a decent result to me. Now, Bucks, and, and we got to move through these because there's a lot of them. Bucks Cowboys. Bucks Cowboys is one I don't feel as. I, this this screams one to me that people probably feel really strong about on either side of this. I'd imagine there are some that are touting that the Cowboys are statistically in a different class to the Buccaneers. They're nearly top 10 in both offense and defense. 11th in offense, 12th in defense. Um, a very balanced team. That's without Dak Prescott for a lot of the year. Um, the Buccaneers are 8-9. Um Really rough offensively. Their defense is decent. I'd imagine some people probably feel pretty strongly that the, the the Cowboys are just a better team. I'd imagine some people probably feel pretty strongly that the Cowboys always choke in the playoffs. I do think I will take the Buccaneers here. I think I'll take the Buccaneers because it's at home. I think I would have gone with the home team either way in this matchup. But I think that is going to be an advantage for the Buccaneers. They also have Tom Brady. He, he does stuff in the playoffs. Okay, I don't know if you guys have heard. Yeah, yeah, whatever. He sucks. Um, but in the playoffs, he's all right. Uh, and then you've got the Cowboys who, in the playoffs, under McCarthy, it's just, uh, it's rough. It's rough. Uh, so I think for that reason, I'll take the Buccaneers. I think that one will be pretty close, too. I think... I think Seahawks 49ers will be a blowout in, in favor of the 49ers. I think the other two games I expect to be close, but I'm going Vikings Buccaneers. I'll go with the home team in all three games on the AFC side. Now, or the NFC side. Now the AFC side, 
bit of a slip because I think I'm just so excited to talk about this. Dolphins Bills. This one is God, I would have been excited about this one if Tua's brain had not turned into soup throughout the 2022 season. Uh, because of that, Skyler Thompson is going to be starting for the Dolphins. This will be an unholy beatdown. This will be one of the biggest beatdowns in in wild card recent wild card history. I I think I'll go Bills by like 20 to 30. I cannot imagine a universe where this game is close. The, the Bills are probably the best team in the AFC this year. And the uh, the Dolphins without Tua are, like, not in a good spot, especially when that QB is Skyler Thompson. I just... I don't really see how the Dolphins could win this game. I'm not even trying to, like... They just won't. Let's do, Actually, let's just keep it there. The Dolphins will not win this game. They'll probably lose it by a lot. Uh, now, Bengals-Ravens. This is a good one. This is a good one. This is going to be heated. Um, now, it's still looking like Lamar Jackson is going to be out for this game, which is a huge bonus for the Bengals. They've got a more than capable... Uh, Backup QB and Tyler Huntley, but he's not Lamar Jackson. He's got a lot of shortcomings. He's someone that you do not want starting against the Bengals in Cincinnati. Ravens as a team have been pretty good this year. You know, uh, offensively they're decent. Defensively they're they're above average, as opposed to the Bengals who are you know the other way around really uh they're they're a good offensive team and a decent defensive team i think the Bengals will win this one comfortably i i really wish we could have had lamar playing in this one and and maybe we still could i don't want to jump the gun but according to the reports i've seen it's very unlikely the Bengals are also one of that top three in the AFC that I perceive to really be the only teams with a chance to win it. It's tough for me to see them going out round one. I think Joe Burrow's got them in a spot where they're they're doing pretty good. Uh, I, I do think without Lamar, this should be a pretty comfortable win for the Bengals. So we'll move on to Jaguars, Chargers. Which should be a great game. I'm actually I'm really excited for this one. Trevor Lawrence versus Justin Herbert is super exciting to me. Uh, with how Trevor Lawrence has been playing second half of this year. Jaguars are on a roll. Uh, Chargers start it, finish strong to make it to the playoffs too. Uh, these are two up and coming teams that are not quite there yet this year. But man, they got some positive momentum and some stuff to be excited about. Now the Jaguars were a, were 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 a, let's just be honest they were a nightmare defensively their passing defense was horrible. A lot of this stuff has been washed over though by the fact that they just finished the year strong and they had a lot of positives offensively. Chargers same story but their their rushing defense was their weakness, 28th in the NFL, just not something you want to see. These are two weak defenses, two exciting offenses, um, and two offenses that are actually tailored to be able to take advantage of those defenses, defenses, defensive weaknesses. Ah, defensive weaknesses on the other team. So it's going to be, I, I think this one will be an interesting coaching matchup as well, because you'll need to see how each... Coaches taking advantage of the weaknesses of the other team uh, and using the vast offensive amounts of talent that each team has uh, that I'm a big fan of to to make it work and to to get some points on the board. I, I, I'm taking Jaguars here. I think the Jaguars want a close one. I love the Jaguars long term. I've been a big fan of the Jaguars all year. I was disappointed to see them start slow, but I'm not surprised to see them start finish strong really good good foundational year for them and i'm very excited to to see how they go 
but yeah, just to, to round it up, my picks, I'm going 49ers in a, in a blowout. I want Vikings and Buccaneers to win close at home. I want the Bills in just a disgusting, disgustingly big blowout. Maybe the biggest win of the playoffs. Um, then Bengals win comfortably, and I think the Jaguars and Chargers play a slobber knocker, and I'm taking Jaguars close at home. So I'm going with every home team week one, which surely will be a good decision, and I'll go 6-0, and and surely every home team will win. Uh, but now that you got to see me hear all my correct predictions, we get to go back to the the fighting Pels, my Pelicans who are desperately, desperately fighting to stay afloat in a relentless world that despises them and won't let them have healthy players. Uh, we, we're we doing okay. The Pelicans are doing all right. The Pelicans are still 25 and 17. They're coping with the Zion and Brandon Ingram losses as well as you could expect, I think. Um, you know, two in five in our last seven, which isn't good. We, but, but you have to contextualize it with both the brutal, brutal road stretch we've been going through at Memphis, at Philly, at Dallas, at Washington, at Boston. Only broken up with two home games against Houston and Brooklyn that you went 50-50 on. So a really, really rough stretch of games. Rough injury luck going on right now. And you're still staying alive. CJ McCollum is playing out of his mind to get us a couple wins here. Um, he has been great since Zion Williamson's gone out. And that's kind of always been an interesting dynamic with CJ is whenever whenever Zion or Ingram are not there, he can be the number one guy. The, the interesting thing has been needing him to be the number three guy or the number two guy, which he's been good at recently. I'm just pointing out that it's kind of a funny uh, thing that he's so effortlessly the number one guy on offense, but it's harder for him to fill a lesser role uh, and, and find that same success on lower volume. Now, the, uh, in, in this last week, close loss to Brooklyn, close loss to Dallas, big win over the Wizards, and then a close loss to Boston. Three, three really decent losses, context considered. So you can't be too disappointed with that. Then you get the win over Washington. I think that's what I would have expected uh, from that stretch, one and three. I think we're doing well. I, I actually, I normally, I'm, I'm definitely, I'm, I'm a sky is falling type person, but I think we're doing all right. We're doing pretty well. I think. I think the Pelicans are in a good spot. Twenty five and seventeen. Brandon Ingram's got to be coming back soon. I mean, I look, look. I'll, I'll check right now because I, I, I'm not fully updated with the latest Brandon Ingram status. I feel he has to be coming back soon. There's just no way. It, it, it's impossible. But it, it he's, he's, he's still listed as out. It's his 23rd straight game out. You really have to wonder uh, what's... What's going to happen there? Like, how, when do we get him back? I, it's just, it feels like he has to be back soon. He's been out for so long with such a simplistic inter injury. Um, but, you know, you can't you can't really know. Um, and we the, the assumption has got to be that we're going to be playing without him uh, until he starts to ease back into the lineup, which is not an optimal reality but it is the reality that we live in and it's what we have to accept i i think once this team gets ingram back i think once this team gets zion back i think we make our push for the one seed i think we're potentially the best team in the nba but 
how long can we keep those two on the on the court? That's the only thing that's relevant to all of this. I don't care how many games we lose with one or two of them out. It's like, can we keep both on the court for an extended period of time to compete in the playoffs? Because if we can, we can win anything. But we've got to be able to keep those two guys plus CJ on the court. It's going to be, it's just, it's always, that's always been the the issue here. It's going to be um, something to really, really focus on down the stretch. Now, F1 is back on the channel. It's not actually back. Uh, it's still a couple months till we get started with the actual racing. Uh, but it is early enough that we can start doing the pre-Spain testing predictions, you know? And I've got those locked and loaded. I'm very excited to get those out of the way. This took me a bit of a second to get through. The The top I had thought about a bit already. The top was was pretty easy to just crank out. Top seven, I think, was was where I was really just, okay, let's get let's keep it moving. I know what I want to go here, but once I got past that seven mark, it was challenging. I, I had some struggles. I had some struggles, no doubt. Um so let me pull it up right here. Now we've got the constructors predictions on the left. We have got the drivers predictions on the right. I'm just going to go through my constructors predictions first. Um, and then I'll go through the drivers predictions in a lot more detail and explain how I expect all of this to play out. Now, my Constructors predictions, I went Mercedes to win the Constructors Championship. Then Red Bull, Ferrari, McLaren, Alpine, Aston Martin, Alfa Tori, Alfa Romeo, Haas, then Williams. I think those are all very reasonable, very fair uh, predictions to make based on the quality of the, the drivers and the teams. But... As I get into the driver's ratings and rankings and predictions, I'll be able to explain a bit more. You know, get into a bit more detail, right? So, my prediction to win the 2023 Drivers' Championship, I expect a third-time repeat from Max Verstappen. Max Verstappen is the best racer in the world right now. I say that through gritted teeth as a Lewis Hamilton fan, but it's true right now. He is simply amazing lately he got the best car finally in his career he had the undeniably best car on the grid last year at the beginning his car was strong but towards the end mercedes had the advantage this year unquestionably throughout he had the best or a tied for the best essentially car and he did not let the grid get away with it 15 wins 17 podiums absolutely amazing Special, special season for Max. I've got him repeating here. And when you see the rest of the drivers here, that actually makes you kind of think, oh, this you, you must see this playing in a bit of an interesting way. Because this year, Red Bull won the Constructors' Championship by 230 points. They won it very easily. And Max Verstappen won the Drivers' Championship by 146. Won it very easily. I do not expect that this year. I think Max Verstappen will be in a horse race with the uh, two boys from Mercedes, Lewis Hamilton and George Russell. I'm expecting some heated competition from those two. Now, I do expect Mercedes and Red Bull to have the only two cars that are good enough to compete for a driver's championship or a constructor's championship. But the reason I expect Mercedes to take the edge in the Constructors' Championship is because of their more talented driver lineup. Max Verstappen is the best driver on the grid right now, but Lewis Hamilton is the only driver you could consider his peer in, in terms of skill at the moment. So you match that, and then you've got George Russell, who's a much more skilled driver than Sergio Perez. Sergio Perez, who is one of the biggest underperformers on the grid this year, in my opinion, with the Red Bull. Um if not for a Monaco qualifying mishap and a Singapore qualifying mishap, would have had zero wins in one of the greatest cars in recent history. So, we, but we don't need to talk about that. 
we 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 really don't. But I'll just leave it at the fact that I expect Max to narrowly edge Lewis and then George to be slightly behind those two. And then I expect the Ferrari to be competitive enough to maybe win a race or two. And I expect Leclerc to probably win those races and sneak ahead of Perez due to his consistency and his pace just being a much better driver than Sergio Perez. And... That's not r- outrageous, because guess what? Charles Leclerc finished ahead of Sergio Perez this year in a much worse car. So, you know, it's, 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 that, that should not be even remotely controversial. That's my top five. I expect very reasonably, I think, signs to round out the top six. Uh, the only driver from the big three left. I have a lot of respect for signs, but even in a worse car, I don't think he's enough I don't think there's a big enough gap for him in favor versus Perez for him to beat him in what I'm expecting the gap between those two cars to be. So I do think Perez probably edges out signs. I think Lando Norris, if McLaren makes the strides that I kind of expect the middle of the pack to make, I think McLaren could be challenging for a win this year. I think I think the whole middle of the pack this year is going to be very strong. And that's kind of where I what I really need to drive home before I explain my next few placings. Because for seventh place and eighth place, I have Lando Norris and Fernando Alonso. Now, those guys are the two best drivers in the middle of the pack this year. It shouldn't be obviously. I don't think people would say it's controversial to have them this high based on their skill. I expect McLaren to continue and slightly improve. And I expect Aston Martin, who I think showed some very, very strong improvement in the second half of last year, in addition to some incredible reliability, I think I expect Fernando Alonso to be able to take that car to a lot of points with how unbelievably good of a driver he is. So I expect him to slot in at eighth. Then, after those two... That is when I expect the two Alpine boys to to slide in. And that's where I expect Pierre Gasly and Esteban Ocon to, to slide in. These two were so tough to distinguish for me. And I, I don't even think I needed to. Because I could have just had them 9th, 10th tied. Because I think they will be indistinguishably, indistinguishably close the entire season. I think they're two of the closest drivers in terms of overall skill on the grid. I think Gasly will have a lot to prove and will just have his best year in F1 yet. But I could see Ocon winning this battle as well. Uh, I I think this is one where I would have been fine with either order of those two. Now, I got Oscar Piastri all the way down in 11th. I don't know what most people would think about this one because in my mind, this is just fair. I don't think this would be that bad for Piastri. I think... I think 7th to 12th could very possibly be all McLaren to Alpine Aston Martin drivers. And I think that 4 to 6 group could really separate themselves this year in the way that the 4 to 5 group did this year. So I think this could very much just be a battle between those six. And in that regard, I don't think it's crazy to have Oscar Piastri towards the bottom uh, with Lance Stroll. And I I don't even hate on Lance Stroll as much as others. I do think Piastri will be a better driver. But I I also expect Piastri to have a better car, to be clear. So I expect him to manage to stay ahead of Stroll, but probably behind what in my head is the middle of the pack, I think he'll probably fall behind the rest of them. Now, 13th, Nick DeVries. Nick DeBris as uh, Carlos Sainz might lovingly call him, right? Um, As we saw uh, during one of the Grand Prix. Nick DeVries. I I got high expectations for Nick DeVries. I actually just, I, I think he, I did not, based on what he was going into the season, I don't think I would have had any expectations, but based on what he did this season, I was so impressed, and I was just like, this guy is, this guy is it. I was like, this guy's going to do something next year. And I don't think he'll, like, light the world on fire, 
But I think he's going to outperform Yuki Sonoda. And I think Alfa is going to have a half-decent car next year because I've heard that they're going to be modifying some of their own parts this year to, to, to put into their build as opposed to just fitting all Red Bull parts into their chassis, uh, which I think generally turns out to be a positive, even though Red Bull has a lot of the best parts. They're not optimized to fit. They're not optimized to perform maybe with, with the Alpha Tori chassis. So we'll, we'll see uh, how that works out for him. I, I can't pretend to know whether it's going to be a positive or a negative, but from what my understanding in previous situations like this, most of the time this does turn out to be a positive. Now, uh, I've got Valtteri Bottas sandwiched between those two. It's because I think I think once we're down at this point, I think it's very fair to say that Valtteri Bottas is just the best driver down here by a mile. Um, once you get past the 10 mark, it's just it's actually crazy how much better he is than everybody else down here. I think the only driver that's even close to him down here, there are maybe two that are even in the same stratosphere. And that would probably be Piastri and Albon. Um, but, I mean, they're nowhere near as proven uh, or or as experienced or, you know, maybe even as pacey as, as Valtteri is at his absolute best. Now, I've got, I've got him down this far because I don't expect Alpha to really put a great car out next year. I don't, I don't have high expectations for him. I think they may get a little lazy until we see Audi come in. Uh, I've actually got him. I've got him two spots ahead of his teammate Guan Yu Zhou. So I, I and I don't even think Zhou's a bad driver. So that should say what I think about Valtteri. But I do think that the Alpha will be an eighth place car, maybe seventh, maybe ninth. I don't really think they're going to be anywhere near the middle of the pack, though, uh, which is why I've got him down so far. Yuki, I've got him at 15th, as I said. Kevin Magnuson, I was so torn. This was the hardest five to list on the entire list for me. Kevin Magnuson at 16 to Logan Sargent at 20th. Every single spot, I was just trying to, to just order. Because it's interesting, because once we get down here, I think Williams has the best driver duo. Logan Sargent is an incredibly pacey qualifier, one of the fastest drivers from F recent F2. Uh, and Alex Albin is one of the best drivers in, in the back markers, period. He's a great driver. And he's really found his confidence with Williams and his belonging. But they will probably have the worst car, unless they make some big improvements. So, I had to keep them at the bottom, even though I think they're better than Joe, Magnuson, and Hulkenberg. So, I went Magnuson 16, I went Joe 17, I went Albin 18, because I just couldn't bear to put him last, and then I put Hulkenberg 19 and Sargent at 20th. Sargent at 20th felt bad, but he's a rookie in the worst car on the grid. I don't think that would even be that bad for him. You know, I think maybe the goal for him is to not finish 20th, but we'll see. That all just depends on their car, right? That's that's sort of the nature of, of uh, pre-testing predictions in general, I suppose, right? But still, it'll be, uh, it'll be very, very interesting, right, to, to, to see the testing so we can get a better grasp on where will these guys finish, where can we put all these, you know, brackets around the performance gaps between certain sections of the field? Because that's always what makes it interesting is just dissecting the field, separating it into specific groups, and looking at how those groups are going to interact with each other. Especially in the years where the, the, the grid hasn't been as close as it was, you know, in, in its best years, really. You know, like last year, when we did not really have a competitive season, especially at the very top. So you had to, you know, analyze the battles below that to find the entertainment, which I've never had a problem with. I think that's kind of like a super entertaining part about F1 is there are battles everywhere and the championship isn't like the only relevant thing. You're fighting for money and test time and it's like, 
you, you there's this weird balance where if you it, it, you're you're a lower tier team so you probably want money but if you do worse you get more test time so you can make your car better and it's like which of those is more important it, f1's just a fascinating sport I, I could i could wax lyrical about how how interesting it is to me from a statistical financial entertainment uh spectacle standpoint i i i just think it's a fantastic fantastic competition and spectator sport but that is going to wrap it up for a bit of a short episode of The Red Zone, I will admit. Uh, I've got to apologize. I have got, like, the weirdest, like, throat ache, like, sore throat that I've been having for a day or two. I was hoping it would wear off by the time I recorded. It just hasn't. I don't really know why. Um, so I, I, I just literally was having to take breaks throughout recording this, and I just don't feel like I could make it a, a, a normal-sized episode like I would. Tried to make it as long as I could, as entertaining as I could, uh, and talk about as much as I could uh, while nursing uh, this throat injury that has turned out to be so severe, unfortunately. Uh, but yeah, that is going to be it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed. Feel free to go give me a follow, like, subscribe uh, on YouTube, Instagram, Spotify, TikTok, all in the background over there. Uh, but yeah, until episode nine, that'll be it. Appreciate everybody for listening. Peace.